Welcome to Learning Photography with Duck. Here's your host, Duck. Hello, good people, and welcome once again to another edition of Learn Photography with Duck. I am once again your host, and welcome to December. We are in the last month of the year, and uh, this actually, I I believe, I believe this month uh, is a full year of these Zoom sessions. So I, I can't recall exactly when I started these Zoom sessions, but I think it was at the beginning of the year. I'd have to look back. But anyway, um, <clears throat> we're looking forward to a new year. So far, we haven't had any snow here in Connecticut, but, you know, who knows? Who knows? Maybe around the corner. Uh, anyway, uh, I want to welcome our newest members here. We have Pallavi uh, and uh, uh, Michelle who are joining us. And of course we have our regulars, Bob and Brian and Alan and Gloria. Uh, and that's it. Oh, Bill, Bill emailed me. He said that he's got an, an evening shoot so he won't be able to make our meeting. So we're gonna miss Bill. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, I have an announcement for the beginning of the year. All right, for those of you who are Patreon members, uh, on occasion in the past, uh, I've asked some of our Patreon members, you know, uh, some kind of like leading questions, trying to feel out what it is that you guys wanted. And I kind of hinted at making short form videos that target very specific tasks uh, within Lightroom. And... Uh, the feedback that I've gotten was very positive, very responsive. And so uh, what I've decided to do, and I've already started working on them, is I'm going to build a video curriculum for our Patreon members uh, that basically takes uh, the, the whole entire Lightroom program and puts it on to short form videos. And what this means is that you can watch the videos front to back, and it's going to go through the entire process of introducing you to Lightroom, uh, uh, the, the various elements of the Lightroom interface, uh, and, and then it's gonna get deeper into the catalog, how to edit images, how to print images, and the whole, the whole shebang. All right. And I'll be working on this throughout the year. Obviously, it's it's a, a pretty big project, but it's going to be available to Patreon members only. And the nice thing about that is that if you have trouble in a specific task, you'll be able to go to a very specific uh, uh, video. So, for example, you know, you, you forgot how to... Uh, uh, how how to do your settings, uh, you know, in the settings dialog box, you can go to that video and it'll walk you through the entire process, all right? Or if you say, okay, you know, I, I kind of get the gist of importing images, but I'm forgetting a couple of things, you can go to that video and watch the process, okay? Uh, eventually, I'll probably be putting it on some kind of uh, website that would make it easier to browse through, I haven't quite gotten there yet. So, but anyway, that's in the pipeline. I wanted to make you guys aware of it. All right. All right. Um, also, uh, last Wednesday, we got rained out. Uh, the CTPPA had their uh, monthly photo walk scheduled for uh, the Tidal Marsh over in North Haven, the, the um, Tidal Marsh Trail. But unfortunately, we got rained out. So uh, I got a call from the organizer there and says, hey, let's just push it to next Wednesday, which is in two days on the 7th. It'll be the same time, 1 o'clock, simply because it's you know getting darker earlier. But we're going to meet behind the Target store uh, off of Universal Drive in North Haven. That is, I guess, one of the entries to the Tidal Marsh Trail. Uh, and we'll be there for about an hour or so, hour, hour and a half. 
And if anybody's still with us at the end, uh, there's plans of maybe heading over to, um, what was it, Friendlies, I think. Yeah, Friendlies for, you know, maybe something uh, quick bite to eat. So anyway, if you're not doing anything next Wednesday, one o'clock, uh, join us. It's free to anybody, even though it's it's a CTPPA event. They open it up to anybody who wants to join us. It's basically just let's have fun with friends and photograph stuff. I've never been there, so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, for December, uh, originally they weren't going to do anything for the month of December, but they decided, well, you know what? Let's plan something. If it comes through, it comes through. If nobody, you know, we'll we'll see what happens. But of course, they decided they're not going to do anything lighthearted. <laughs> they said, hey, you know what would be cool? If we could go over to Shephog Dam and, and photograph the eagles there. Because apparently there's a short window that they allow visitors into that area. And to, they have a whole set up for eagle watching um and the season starts i think it's like mid-december and it only runs for like three or four months and then that's it uh it's you it's by reservation so once i get all the details i'll share it with you guys over facebook um uh i'll try to see if i can have some more information by next monday but right now, it's the date is to be announced, because um, uh, uh, and more than likely uh, we will need to make some kind of reservations, uh, because you know they require reservations in order to get in. But anyway, if you've ever been to Shepog Dam, uh, from what I understand, I've never been there. From what I understand, it's awesome uh, for viewing and photographing eagles. Okay, so that's coming up the pipe pi pipeline. So. Uh, stand by. All right. What I want to do today is talk a little bit about uh, exposure, okay? But in the context of how to manipulate exposure within Lightroom and specifically uh, touch on something that's called the exposure zones. All right, those of you uh, ha that may have studied uh, film photography may be aware of Ansel Adam and his zone system. Uh, he, he broke film up into uh, uh, 10 zones, 11 zones, something like that. And he devised this, this kind of like uh, fairly simple to understand system of uh, being able to place your exposure, all right? Of course, we're not dealing with film here with our digital cameras, and digital sensors kind of behave a little bit of opposite of how film uh, sensitivity worked. Uh, so there are some differences, but overall, the underlying foundational principles are still the same. And I thought I'd, I'd touch upon that to kind of help you get another tool in your toolbox on how to uh, be able to look at and analyze and develop your images, okay? So what are we talking about? Well, uh, of course my stylus, okay. If we go to, let me go to the desktop. Oh, wrong button. <clears throat> If we go to the Lightroom uh, develop setting, okay, up in this corner here. Oh, hold on, my cursor thingy is not working here. Why is my cursor thingy not working? All right, here we go. Right here. All right. We have uh, a, a histogram bar, okay? And the histogram, let me put, pull up an image. We'll be using this image uh, for the class today. But as soon as you load up a, a, an image, you're going to see a graph. All right, you can see it here. 
all right? And what that does is it gives us a count of all the pixels that are in use within the image and where along the uh, luminosity scale they all kind of fit, okay? And you can see that over on, as, we, as we're looking at the uh, histogram, what we have is we have all our dark pixels here and all our light pixels here. All right, so we go from dark to light across here, right? And if you notice, as you hover over these, you're going to see, uh, I don't know how well you can see it uh, on, on the screen here. Oh, you know what? Let me share the screen. That should make it a little bit better. Hold on one second. I always forget to do this. There we go. Okay. Uh, as you hover over each of these sections, you're going to see it highlighted. All right. Uh, into these kind of like quadrants. And we have five quadrants here. Okay. Um, the uh, each quadrant coincides with a slider. All right. So if we look further down, all right, we're going to see these sliders here. All right. That are labeled as tone. All right. And we're going to notice that the first slider is the exposure slider. And if I hover over it and you look at the histogram above, you're going to see that middle section highlighted, right? If I go off and on, you can see, all right? And then if we skip, we'll skip contrast because that's really nothing to do with our, our tone here. And if we go down to highlights, all right, we see the... Uh, this section here lit up, okay? And then we go to shadows, it flips to this side. It's hard to see because we have the the uh, the bar graph here, right? And then we got whites, which is all the way to the end, and we have blacks, which is all the way to the opposite end, okay? So if you notice, if I hover over these sliders, all right, each particular section of that histogram is going to light up okay so that hopefully should be clue number one is that you know we can of course manipulate the image by using these sliders but we can also go up to the histogram and we can grab a section and moving it left to right so if you click and drag left to right okay it's going to move the corresponding slider. I don't know if you can see the slider moving back and forth down below. Okay. I'm actually grabbing it from the histogram. Okay. And of course, if we want to return it, this to zero, we just double click on the, we can double click on the, the label for the um, slider, or we can double click on where it says tone. It'll reset the whole thing. All right. Everybody follow that so far, right? Okay. So, what does this mean? Let's talk a little bit about this, all right? Because a lot of people disregard this because they don't know how to read it. So let's delve a little bit into learning how to read uh, uh, this particular, um, you know, piece of the interface and how it relates to our image, okay? All right, so for that, for that, uh, we're gonna go to one of my favorite demonstration uh, tools for, you know, kind of explaining how uh, the histogram, uh, how we can manipulate the, the histogram. And the way I do it is, I, I have a little setup here. I explain it by the use of a spring, all right? So this is a slinky, everybody remember a slinky? All it is is a spring, okay? So give me a second, let me scoot over, all right? And uh, hopefully everybody can still hear me okay. All right. You know, I, I, I got this fancy setup here, ooh. See, I, I, 
no expenses uh, spared to to bring quality content to you guys. <laughs> Alan's laughing. Okay, so what we have here is we have a representation of the histogram grid uh, from Lightroom. All right, and if you notice that what we have is we have uh, all our uh, we have white all the way to the right hand side okay and we have black all the way to the left hand side all right and what this represents is the full range of exposure that you can have in an image everything from solid black to solid white okay and of course uh, uh when you're looking at at the histogram with a image loaded you're going to see you know a a bar graph indicating you know how many pixels of dark you have how many pixels of shadows how many pixels in the midtones etc cetera, etc cetera, okay all right and one of the things you're going to notice is that uh well, what I what I want to stress is sometimes when I'm talking about exposure, I'm using terms uh, that don't quite line up with the labels that Lightroom assigns to these sections or these zones, right? And uh, as we understand now that Lightroom has five sections, we have uh, the exposure, which is the first slider on the top. All right, exposure illustrates our midtones. All right, so right smack in the center is our 50% gray. All right, and then from that 50% gray, as we start going outward, all right, we start getting darker to one side and we start getting lighter to the other side. And at one point, Lightroom says, okay, at this point, we're going to make a transition from being called an exposure to being called our highlights. All right. And then there's a section of very light gray tones, not quite white, but very, very light gray tones. Okay. And then we come to another break point that Lightroom says, okay, at this point, we're going to label these our whites, okay? And how they determine at what point, you know, mathematically, I have no clue, okay? However, from experience, I've noticed that these very, very light pixels that are labeled in the whites, these tend to be very low contrast highlights that tend to get lost very, very easily when printing, okay? The same goes to the opposite side when we go over to, when we go to the dark side. Oh, let me strain this out. When we go to the dark side, again, just like if we were traveling in that direction, as we're coming to this side, we get a break that we travel from mid-tones into our shadows, and then as we get darker and darker and darker, we get into our blacks. And just like the, the whites on the other side, this tends to be an area that is highly affected during printing. All right, a lot of people tend to lose fine detail in the very heavy dark shadows. And anybody who does your own printing, you may notice that one of the things that a lot of people will do with their images when it goes to print is they will shift the exposure from this side into this zone, okay? So some of you are probably already aware with the term zone shifting or zone placement. And that's where you tell the software, it says, okay, all of the pixels that are represented in this area, what I want you to do is I want to shift it by making them lighter so that they now fall into this area, okay? So what we're doing is we're placing our, our exposure from blacks 
into our shadows so that they print lighter. Because if you've done any kind of printing, you understand that you lose uh, some of the subtlety because of the uh, greater contrast uh, caused by printing. All right, it's, it's just because of the pigments, okay? So we have, uh, in Lightroom, we have black, shadows, exposure, highlights, and whites. And, uh, you know, you, it, if you remember those labels, that's fine. But what I want you to do is I want you to understand their association with how they relate in, in the physical world with physical prints. Okay, so blacks tend to be low contrast shadows, the heavy, heavy, you know, deep, dark shadows where you barely see any kind of detail. Okay, the shadows tends to be shadow areas where you can actually see what the structures are. So, for example, uh, all right, for example, you're, you're taking a nature shot and you have a very bright sky. Then you have the canopy of the trees, and then underneath the trees, you have some very heavy, heavy shadows. If you can see into the shadows and, and be able to discern other tree trunks within that shadow area, right, you are looking at shadows with details. Okay. And I'll show you examples in our, in our uh, sample later when we actually get into Lightroom. Okay. Where we start losing it is when the shadows are so dark that it's very difficult to de to determine where one object ends and another object begins because the the the, the pixels are so dark it's it, we can't uh, quite make out the resolution right and of course the same thing happens with highlights right and this tends to be. Uh, more for like clouds or if you're photographing things on, uh, you know, like uh, with, you know, product photography, you know, anything that is considered a white product on a white background, we start getting into this problem area where we need to be sure that we place our product within the highlights while we print, place our background into our whites section in order to create enough contrast so that the two don't disappear into each other. All right, I hope that makes sense. All right, so what does this mean for us when we are manipulating our exposure? This spring, now represents our histogram, right? All the pixels from our image lie within the spring. And the first thing you're gonna notice is that the two ends of our spring are locked in place, all right? So this becomes, once, once we set our black point and our white point, that becomes our exposure range. All right. Um, and then we have, you know, if we if we analyze our image, you know, we can say, OK, you know, uh, um, the the example image on. Let me pull it up real quick. The example image we'll be using is my uh, my model, Amanda, which we photographed. Uh, our last session, the uh, uh, in-studio session, all right? She's Caucasian, so she has very, very light skin. Caucasian skin falls into this area, all right? It kind of usually, uh, um, it's in depending on how pale they are, it'll be in the highlights crossing slightly into our exposure zone. OK, so if we were to look at this as a percentage, you know, where um, uh, whites are usually labeled as 100 percent. All right. So we have 100 percent light. 
and blacks is 0% light. Okay, 0% light. All right, so usually Caucasian skin falls somewhere in the uh, roughly 60, 70 percent, 80 percent. Well, maybe not that high, but 80 percent uh, ratio here. All right. Um, <clears throat> uh, Latin skin or brown skin tends to fall a little bit more closer to the midtones. OK, so once you start making associations with what it is you're photographing and where they sit on the uh, histogram, it then allows us the ability to manipulate our, our exposure tones based on understanding where our exposure actually sits. So, for example, <clears throat> uh, we photograph a person using natural light and we're we're kind of trying to balance uh you know between our shadows and our highlights make sure that we don't blow out our highlights and uh we don't have our shadows way way too dark uh and we we photograph the person uh, oftentimes we notice that the person is looking a little underexposed and we normally can can understand that because when we're looking at the image, we, we see that their skin tone looks darker than what we expect, what's normal, all right? So if their skin tone is falling in this area and we know that, you know, let's say they're, you know, like Amanda, she's light skinned, it should be here, then we know where we are and where we need to go. Make sense? So that means we're going to take our, our exposure from here and we're going to place it here. All right. And because we know where along this graph our current exposure sits, all right, we know exactly what part of Lightroom we need to use to modify that exposure, all right? So if we looked at, you know, she should be here, but she's here because she is underexposed, less light, okay? We need to make sure that we get our exposure because that's where she sits, exposure. We take our exposure uh, slider and we move it towards the light side, we add light. Okay, hopefully that makes sense, okay? Now here is the tricky part and the reason why I have the spring is because each one of these elements is attached to the next one. And whenever we take a section and we move it, just like the spring, what you're gonna notice is that it compresses to one side and it expands to the other side, right? You see that? All right, so if we take our exposure slider and we move it over, we're gonna get an expansion, okay? And we're gonna get a compression, all right? So what happens is when we take our exposure and we shift it, we're brightening our image because we're going towards the, the, the light side. We're, we're taking all these pixels that are, uh, are in our mid-tone grays and we're making them lighter, okay? So from this side, we're pushing all these pixels, we're pushing them lighter. And all these pixels, we're pulling them lighter. Okay, we're pulling them in, okay? Now, because these two ends are locked, they're attached, that means for, for one, we can't get lighter than 100% light, okay? And if we go this way, all right, 
we cannot get darker than 0% black. All right, 0% light, 100% black. Make sense? Okay. But what happens is, all right, let's say we need to, to bring our exposure down. As we bring our exposure over, we are compressing our shadows, all right, and see these little tabs? All right, I put these little tabs here. Hopefully you can see I'm good, okay? This rep these represents our different zone breaks, all right? So we have our whites, we have our highlights, we have our exposure, we have our shadow, and we have our blacks. So if we go to the, you know, to uh, exposure to the black, notice that this gets compressed, this gets compressed, and obviously this will start getting compressed too, okay? But this will compress a little bit more than this. And the reason being is that this zone is the furthest from the midtone. All right, because all of these are connected. We have our midtones, the midtones connected to the shadow tone, the shadow tones connected to the black tones. Put that one in your head. Okay because they're connected they're going to directly affect its neighbor all right just like as i move the exposure towards the dark side it's going to expand our highlight section and it's going to expand our white section okay but if you notice this tab moves further and and faster than this one this one only moves a tiny little bit. Hopefully you can see that. Okay. This one moves a tiny little bit. This one moves a lot more. Okay. That's because our white section is the furthest away from exposure. All right. So if I were to take, let's say, our blacks slider and just move the blacks, you're going to notice, well, my, my, my spring's a little bit too loose you're going to notice that it's barely affecting this side here, okay? Because it's the furthest away. All right, so why am I pointing this out, All right? The reason I want you to understand that particular concept is because we can use that to really, really fine-tune our exposure settings especially when we're doing local adjustments, okay? Local adjustments. And we'll get into that uh, uh, and, and when we do our live de demonstration, I'll explain all that, okay? What you need to walk away with is how these are all interconnected and one affects the other, all right? That being said, some of you that have been with me long enough have heard me say that the way Lightroom has their slider set up, they have the exposure slider first. That's the topmost slider, right? And then we go from our exposure, we go to highlights, then shadows, then whites, and then blacks. So we're, we're doing this kind of like hopscotch thing right but they have the exposure slider first now as i move this all right let's say i want to make things lighter okay it's going to affect its neighbor in the highlights and its neighbor in the shadows the most okay but because we are one uh, one step away, all right, so if you want to, yeah, so we got one step, and then we have our blacks, okay, and then one step, we have our whites, because we're one step away from the midtones, it will also affect our blacks and our whites significantly, okay? So what I normally suggest when you start editing, all right, is actually start with the ends. 
with the blacks and the whites. All right, and what this does is this will set your uh, black point and your white point. And then from there, work inwards, okay? Because as I said, everything's interconnected. If you manipulate this, all right, this is going to affect the shadow section a lot, all right? And it will affect this side of our exposure a little bit, okay? Same thing with our whites. We set our white point. It's going to affect our highlights, all right? And to a lesser extent, this side of our exposure, okay? And what you're gonna find is that because we're starting on the ends, it's not going to really affect the other side. So if I'm, if I'm manipulating my whites, it's not affecting the shadows and blacks all that much. Make sense? Okay, once you've manipulated your highlights and your shadows, then you can fine tune it with your exposure. Okay, one of the things I like to say is, you know, the exposure is kind of like using a baseball bat, you know, to, uh, uh, to hammer in a nail, all right? It's, or a sledgehammer to hammer in a, you know, in a nail, and then, uh, here you get into, you know, your specialty hammers. Okay. All right. Any questions on that so far? Let me come back to here. Any questions on, on that explanation? Are we good? Okay. Sure. You were saying uh, regarding skin color when you were looking at the, the model's face earlier. She's Caucasian versus uh, a black person, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, would that, would you play around with your, because I remember in other discussions of uh, the histogram where it seems like we want to go for a standard bell curve is, is the op, is, was the optimum. I remember. Mm -hmm. So, well, I don't know if it is, but then, so then would we look at this histogram differently for the model? versus, let's say, someone who's darker complexion? Uh, no. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Let me see if I, I can uh, clarify this a little bit in your mind. Okay. Uh, what you're trying to do is, as you are reading the histogram, you are trying to make it form into a specific picture. That's, that's not what we want to do. Each image is going to have its own distinct histogram. All right. Well, let, let me let me just back it up a little bit. Uh, a histogram is nothing more than a bar graph. All right, a bar graph. Uh, actually, hold on. Give me one second. Let me see if I can find my tutorial images here. Uh, where are we? Miscellaneous classroom. Let me switch over to desktop here. Uh, charts. Okay. Here we go. All right. Here's, here's the uh, histogram. Okay. Let me see if my, okay. And we have uh, a photograph. And when we have the photograph, it's literally gonna do some kind of, uh, you know, little mountain shape. Uh, let me sit down for a second. Okay. What this represents is a count, all right, from, uh, zero to 255, all right? So this is where we get our, our uh, RGB, all right? Um, we're going to disregard color during this, this uh, uh, 
discussion, okay? And we're just going to talk about luminosity in terms of white and blacks and all the grays in the middle, okay? All right, so you can see we have, you know, our uh, black to mid-tone to whites uh, represented here, okay? There are 256 steps or 256 columns across here, all right? Each column is one point away from its neighbor, all right? So we start at zero, meaning it's 100% black, absolutely no light. The next one is one. The next one to that is two and three and four and so far, correct? <clears throat> what this does is it says, okay, uh, let's take this one. All the pixels in this image that fall into the numerical value of 128, it's going to plot it, all right? And it's going to say there are this... Obviously, it's not going to return you an actual number. It's just going to return you a column representation. Okay. And of course, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're plotting the heights of all of these columns. Okay. So if we have a peak here, all right, this is just counting all of the pixels that are in this part of the histogram, all right? And we can see that those are the most pixels we have, okay? Now, obviously, when we're studying an image, we're not going to be worried about columns, all right? Because, you know, uh, uh, tones are, are not that segregated. All right, but we are going to look at peaks. Okay. And we're also going to look at valleys. Okay. In this case, you can say there's a valley here. Okay. There's also a valley in between these three peaks. And after a while, all right, you're going to be able to say, okay, well, this peak represents these you know points of of gray or or these points of luminosity in our image okay while this represents you know let's let's say this uh, uh we have a uh portrait that says this represents her face this represents her hair because she has light colored hair uh this represents the background because we're putting her against a dark background but there happens to be a highlight uh, in the background, all right? And this represents all the specular highlights that are in her hair, uh, maybe, you know, points of, of highlight on the jewelry, all right? You get to, to be able to recognize these points the, the more you study the histogram in comparison to the image you are looking at. Okay, so at the beginning, a lot of people are taught what you want to see is that nice bell curve, because what that means is you don't have a lot of shadows, okay, because we have a valley here, and we have a valley here, so we don't have a lot of, you know, really, really bright specular highlights. Everything is falling within this section of the histogram which is obviously it's great this is considered a a beautiful uh exposure because everything falls within that that uh uh section of visible light that we are able to discern very very clearly we can see into the shadow and see the detail and make out the different elements in the shadow area as well as in the highlight area, okay? This allows us to see the, that nice contrast of clouds against the blue sky, okay? All right, so a lot of us, you know, look for that. 
But the reality is that not every image is going to give you that kind of histogram. All right. And as an example, we have this image of Amanda that we're going to be using. If we look at the histogram, what do we see? We see a clumping all the way on the dark side of our image. All right, so if we were to compare that to that bell curve, this image fails grossly, All right? Is it a bad image? Is it a wrong image? Is it bad exposure? Well, the exposure needs to be corrected a little bit, but no, it's appropriate to the subject matter and the lighting condition that we gave it. Make sense? So we cannot expect a bell curve out of this type of image simply because if we look at it, we see it's it, she's wearing a dark outfit against a dark background, all right? And she's being lit from one side, so that renders the other side of her in shadow. So all the shadow areas is an underexposure of the true tone uh, values of, of whatever, you know, she's wearing and her skin tone and her hair color. All right, make sense? Okay. But we can read uh, all this information within the histogram. We can say, okay, well, we know that our skin tone should be in this area, okay? And what we're seeing is we have this section here. I, I, let me see if, if we can, okay, yeah, all right. See that? We have, we have that little plateau that is, you know, just barely there, just barely there. Okay, and if we look where our black, our our uh, uh, whites should be, our you know all the the really really highlight specular uh, whites and very very light light grays, they're non-existent. Okay, so that tells me that our white point, all right, our white point, which should be here is actually here make sense okay so we have this difference so if i want to correct for this i have to take this part of the histogram and push it that way all right but before we do that we need to understand what this is going to affect, all right? So if we look at the image, what does that little uh, plateau of light pixels represent? Well, if we look at the image, we can see that the brightest part of the image is right here. It's, it's her blouse. She's wearing a uh, white blouse with, you know, dark stripes. So it's reflecting the majority of our light back towards the camera. Okay. So this represents this. Make sense? Okay. If we look next to it, all right, we can see that there's a little bit slope up. All right. And then we have another plateau, all right, okay, this actually represents her skin tone. That's this section right here and, you know, part of her, uh, her hair, right, actually probably even that part of her hair, okay. That represents that. Is some of this in there? Absolutely, there is, because we can see that there are shadow areas in our 
uh, blouse, but we're not going to be that nitpicky. We want to generalize, all right? Again, it's not looking at each particular column. It's looking at the groups, all right? And associating those groups with what we're looking at, okay? So we can see that this here represents pretty much that, okay? And we know that looking at her skin tone, it looks a little under uh, exposed. That means we need to move that that way. Okay. So now we have our white point that needs to move over and we have our skin tone that needs to move over. Make sense? Okay. But if we look at the background, the background, I don't want to move. I like the way that background is looking. Okay. And in truth, let's zoom into this section here. All right. We can see shadow with detail. I don't know how well that's coming across on the video. All right. But we have areas of shadow and areas of lesser shadow okay and then here's another shadow and then lesser shadow and then another shadow and then lesser shadow and that's giving us that tonality where we can see the wrinkles in the in the clothing okay so we have shadow here with detail all right and some of it, uh, because I really cannot see any kind of texture of the clothing, we know that this is our shadow with no detail, okay, or low contrast shadow. All right, so this is falling somewhere in here, all right, all the way at the very end, while this is falling somewhere in here make sense okay all right hopefully uh, you're you're starting to make some uh, associations here okay all right and then of course we have a lot of mid-tones uh on the shadow side of her face okay and if we were to divide this right down to center all right where this is our 50 percent gray all right we notice that some of this area, all right, is falling into that 50% gray part, okay? And it's starting to fall on this side, okay? So if we look at, <clears throat> at this right here, okay, we have all the way on this side here, we have here, and all the way on this side here, we have our highlights, okay? The specular highlights fall here. Our shadow of our skin tones fall here, right? And this represents the tonal range for her skin tone, okay? So when we, when we are able to identify the different parts of the histogram like that, we can then say, okay, well, which slider do I need to manipulate in order to affect those parts of the image? Okay. All right. Any questions about identifying the different parts? All right. It does take a little bit of practice. All right. But the nice thing is that when we go into, let me bring it into the develop module. Uh, when we go into, uh, the actual manipulating the sliders, we can visually see the effect, okay? All right, <clears throat> here's another tool that you can use. Give me one second. <clears throat> uh, the histogram has some information along uh, underneath it. Okay, so if we look at it, we can see that it gives us some information about our image, our ISO, our focal length, our aperture, and our shutter speed. Okay. 
I don't know why they put it there because when I'm editing, I could care less about those numbers or that information. I think they just needed to put something there. All right. However, when we take our cursor and we hover over our image, wherever that cursor is, you are going to see a percentage or not a yeah, percentage, all right, uh, underneath that histogram. Okay. And you're going to notice that it's there, there's three numbers, R, G, and B. Okay, so it's going to give you a percent of red, a percentage of uh, green, and a percentage of blue. Okay, and that's our three channels. All right. Now, for those of you who are new, one of my trick questions is, when we take a color photograph, are we taking color picture or are we taking a black and white picture? All right, that's the trick question. When we take a picture with our digital camera, are we taking a color picture or are we taking black and white picture? All right, think on that. I'll give you that in a moment. Okay. All right, so these are these numbers are in percentage from zero to a hundred. Okay, and we know that zero is 0% light, 0% light, which is black, okay? And 100 is a 100% light, all right? And the most you can have represented uh, uh, pixel-wise as 100% white is pure white, no detail. Pure white, no detail, okay? And the same way, 0% is pure black, no detail. All right. Okay. So if, if we know that our exposure splits the difference at 50%, all right, and from that 50%, we go uh, a certain number of steps towards the light and a certain number of steps towards the dark, that then we know that from that middle point, you know, we have a some leeway of what is our termed our midtones. Okay. So looking at the image, we can see that you know uh, part of this falls on one side of that fifty percent range, and part of it falls on the other side, and. Just for visual sakes, this is not scientific by any means. We can probably draw a line right along that shadow. <laughs> All right, just for visual sakes, okay? All right, so if this is 50%, you've got uh, skin tone going over to the light side, and we got skin tone going over to the shadow side, okay? All right, doesn't quite work that way, but hopefully simplifies the visual a little bit, all right? However, we can take our cursor and we can hover over that area and the point underneath our cursor is going to return some numbers, all right? And it's going to let us know exactly where we sit exposure-wise, all right? So if I go and I hover over the highlight section, we can see that we are in the uh, 75 on the red channel and 64 on the green channel. Of course, there's less green in skin tones and more red in skin tones. And that's across the board, whether you're white, black, Hispanic, Mexican, uh, Latino, uh, that's all the same, uh, Chinese, you know, um, uh, Alaskan, you know, British. It doesn't matter. Everybody has red in it and everybody has yellow. Okay. What's yellow? Yellow is the opposite of blue. Okay. Yellow is the opposite of blue. Okay. So you can see that our blue is uh, also very low. It means there's more yellow in her skin tone. Okay. All right. But we're seeing that we're hovering as, let me just see if I can place it there. All right. We're hovering 
uh, the 60 to 70%. So 60 in our blue, 73% in our red. Okay, so we have three numbers, but we can do kind of like general math and we can determine an average, all right? And what do we say our average for uh, Caucasian skin tends to be, all right? Anywhere from seven, uh, from, well, uh, anywhere from 60 to about 80, all right? But typically around 66% for our true tone uh, uh, um, exposure. All right. And what I mean by true tone is the actual color if it was flat lit with proper exposure. OK, so if we have a red ball, we know it's red because of its true tone color. Any specular highlights is an overexposure of our true tone color and any shadow is an underexposure of our true tone color. OK, it's the same thing with skin tone. OK, there is a certain pigment to her skin. That's her true tone color. All right. So if we look at it, uh, we can say, all right, based on how she looks in real life, I can see that this particular skin tone is a little bit underexposed. OK. And if I hover over what should be her skin tone, we can see that, you know, it's a little bit on the dark side. OK, it's starting to go, uh, you know, into the midtones. You can see uh, the red is right in the midtones, but our green and blue are below or to the dark side of our midtones. OK, remember, zero is black, so anything less than 50% we're getting into darker tones, okay? It should be, all right, if we're looking at the numbers, they should be over in the 60% range, all right? So that's how we can kind of edit by the numbers if we want to, okay? But more importantly, we can see that, hey, our per, our numbers are right in the midtones, and what is our midtone slider? What's our midtone slider? Okay. If we go over to this, our midtones are the exposure slider, the exposure slider. Okay. So that means we can take our exposure slider and push it up. Okay, and we notice that her skin tone is getting a little brighter. Okay, makes sense so far. But here's the problem that we illustrated earlier with the spring. Everything's interconnected. So as I bring my exposure over to the bright side, I am pulling my shadows also into the brighter pixels okay because the two parts the exposure are my exposure and my shadows are next door neighbors they're going to be directly affecting each other okay likewise all right we can see in our highlights area that they've gotten a lot brighter also because my highlights and my exposure or my midtones are next to each other, they affect each other equally. Okay. So, one thing that we can look at, let me just reset this, is think about it in a slightly different way. All right. And this is where understanding the, the tools and how they behave really, really you know, comes into play. We have our skin tone here, all right? We have our mid-tone here, okay? We want this shifted over, okay? But if we take this, our 50%, and shift it, it's going to pull this as well as push this, okay? Make sense? All right, but now here we have, okay? 
we are let me highlight this um our highlights okay notice our highlights are right here okay uh, highlights okay if we take our highlights and pull it okay it's going to affect its neighbor which is our whites it's going to pull it this way and it's going to affect our midtones all right our 50 percent okay and pull it because they are neighbors okay this section is going to be less affected and this one's probably not going to be affected at all all right in theory makes sense right all right so let's let's figure it out okay so if we take our highlights and make them brighter we get the expected result we've taken the pixels let me zoom in okay all right and the pixels that were a lot into the uh exposure range we are now look at that we are now in the well into our highlight range okay See that little bump where it, where it steps down, okay? Previously, that was right at that edge. It was right at that edge, okay? Let me see if we reset this, okay? I zoom in. See how, how that little bump is right at the edge? It's just creeping into our highlights, okay? I bring my highlights up, get that true tone, skin tone looking good, okay? That's looking a lot better, all right? It's not affecting the very, very brightest pixels as much, all right? And it's not affecting the darker pixels as much because we've created a buffer away from it, all right? So when we look at and zoom in, all right, we notice that those pixels that were previously in the midtones are now in our highlights. Everybody follow? Are we getting an aha moment? Hopefully. Okay. All right. Now, obviously, I'm working within the global settings, meaning that uh, everything I'm doing uh, in these sliders is going to affect our our image globally. All right. So anything that we do in our blacks is going to affect the entire image. All right, everything that we do in our whites is going to affect the entire image. So notice how back here, all right, uh, there are no white pixels. There are no pixels that would fall into this category, all right? None, none. But it's still being affected because of that, that spring pulling, okay? All right, so we are going to affect things down the line. All right, how much it affects? Well, it depends on how far along you pull the sliders, okay? All right, <clears throat> but that's globally. We can do the same exact thing locally by using local adjustments. So let's say I wanted to... Uh, not do anything else other than her skin tone. What I could do, one of my favorites, I know the AI will detect skin tone, but I still prefer doing this because I feel it gives it a little bit more of a natural look, all right? I can take my highlights and pull up the highlights, okay? And because we are constrained to the area of this mask it's not going to affect any pixels anywhere else in our image okay it's just going to affect the pixels within that circle okay so you can see i can even use it as a spotlight all right you can notice as i move over here it's not affecting that part of the background okay it's not affecting that back of the part of the background because there are no pixels there 
that fall within the range of our highlights. Okay, make sense? All right, it's only affecting the pixels that fall within that range. And that's on her face and neck. All right, and you can see it even affects her blouse because yes, there are parts that uh, uh, within that section because we're not dealing with pure white there. There's nothing there that says pure white. How do I know that? Because when I looked at the histogram in this first part, there were no pixels there. Okay. All right. If I were to place this there, okay, and I bring this up, all right, I'm not maxed out. I want you to see, look, we have pixels now in that white section, in the whites. We have pixels, okay? There weren't pixels there before. There are now because I pushed them into that section by moving my highlights slider. OK, because remember, every slider has a push and a pull behind it. All right. OK, so let me put that back on her face. All right. All right. So now we can say to ourselves, OK. Now that I understand, you know, how to read the histogram. All right. And uh, how to manipulate the tones. All right. I can say. Okay, when I analyze my image for editing, all right, you know, I like to teach, look at the problem areas first, because those are the ones that you're going to want to correct. <clears throat> okay, so I, right off the bat, I identified that her skin tone was underexposed and needed to be brought up. Okay, so now we get into a little bit of the fine tuning and it says, well, I don't want her blouse to compete with her face. Okay. So right now, the way it's looking, let me, uh, let me go back here. Okay. The way that it's looking, all right, this part is the brightest, which is what I want. Okay. Previously, it wasn't. Remember, previously, it wasn't. All right. Previously, her blouse was the, uh, uh, the brightest, okay? But we have parts of the shirt that are very bright, that are competing. So what happens is we, we are here and our vision starts going down, okay? And it keeps traveling along this, this path of lightness, okay? Right? We, we are telling our viewer, all right, follow the yellow brick road down and out of the image. That's not what I want. I don't want people coming in and leaving the image and going, oh, yeah, that's it. Nothing else to look at. OK, uh, what I do want is people to come down. All right. Hit a wall and come back up. OK, because this is where I want people's eyes to be, okay? That's my subject. That's where I want the light to concentrate. So how can we do that? Well, local adjustment, local adjustment. We're gonna go back to our masking tool. We're gonna to create a new one. And for this, uh, one of my favorites is the linear gradient. We take and we build a linear gradient from the bottom up, okay? And so you know our gradient uh, is 100% down at the bottom, 0% effect at the top here, all right, with this center line being our 50% mark, okay? So whatever effect we add, it's going to apply that effect 100%. So if we were to move this up, okay, and it's represented by our, our uh, overlay, we can see that it's applying 100% of the effect below that line. And then it's starting to do a gradation. All right. We're gradating from 100 to 50 to 0. And then from there on, it's 0. Make sense? 
you guys should know that one already. All right. So we're going to place that at the bottom. And what are we attacking? We are attacking the light pixels of that part of the of the image, the lower part. Where do they sit? Well, I would say they sit in the highlights section. Okay. So I'm going to take those pixels and I'm going to darken them up. All right. Now, what we've done is we've created an artificial shadow. All right. There's already a shadow there. What we're just doing is we're amplifying that shadow. We're artificially changing. We're taking those light, uh, the, the light pixels and we're shifting it over to the dark side. We are, we are going from one zone and placing them into another zone. Okay, make sense? All right. And if we want, we could even push it a little bit further by taking all the pixels that went into uh, into the white section, we're going to push them into the dark section. All right. And you can see that it's having a pretty good effect. Okay. So now what it looks like is that it's if I used a more controlled light on my subject, all right? Because what I've done is I've I've created a false fall off, but I'm only affecting the light pixels. I'm not affecting any of the dark pixels because their shadows are already pretty dark. I don't want to push them any further, you know, dark. Okay, we'll lock that in, and now. When we look at it, our eye comes in, travels down, all right, hits that wall and comes back up. Okay. And I did that with two local adjustments and just a couple of sliders. Okay. But knowing which sliders to move is the key. All right, which slide is move? Any questions on what I just explained? We're good. Doc, uh, Doc on, on the photo um, on the left side, is, are you intentionally leaving it dark with no detail? Um. Yeah, I uh, I kind of wanted it a little bit on the moody side. Uh, that was kind of the intent for the lighting setup. Okay. Um, when it comes to lighting, uh, some of you uh, may remember me saying this. When we create an image, uh, we have a certain intent in mind. Okay. And sometimes we know really early on what that intent is. Sometimes it's a process of discovery during the editing of what the intent is. Okay. But the thing is, uh, we, we know what we, we, uh, imbibe the image that we take with, with a certain amount of mood that we read into it ourselves because we have a personal connection to it. As soon as we release that image into the wild, we're not there to explain our intent to the viewer. All right. So it's now up to the viewer to interpret what we have done to the image in order for them to get the intent. Okay. So what's my intent here? Okay. My intent is to showcase Amanda's face. It's a portrait. Okay. So I want people when they come in to look at this image without any explanation from me, I want them to meet Amanda. Okay. And we meet Amanda through her face, not through her, oops, what I do, not through her clothing. Okay. All right. And not through whatever background I use. All right, all that is just dressing to kind of enhance the the scene, okay? Salt and pepper to taste, okay? Uh, but I also don't want to introduce ambiguity, okay? So, you know, we need to now figure out 
uh, what's a nice balance between what we want to show and what we don't want to show. Okay. And of course, we have other tricks besides using light. We can use blur, all right, our aperture settings to throw some things into ambiguity. Okay. But in this case, we're relying more on light. All right. So, yeah, I could uh, open up my shadows. Okay. And you can see that here, I'm going to move the, sh the, the slider back and forth. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, it's it's a subtle change, but it's enough. Okay, uh, I could open it up. Okay, uh, the more you open up your shadows. Okay, here I'm gonna open up a lot. The more you open up your shadows, the more it invites the viewer to explore other areas of the image. Okay, so now. I'm introduced to, in this particular case, all right, because I brightened up the shadows, I'm introduced to Amanda, but I also want you to pay attention a little bit to what she's wearing, okay? Okay, because I've, I've lit it a little bit more, okay? So it, it all comes down to intent, all right? And, and my personal preference, and again, understand, Everything that I'm doing here is very subjective, all right? My interpretation may not be your interpretation, and that's okay, okay? You might say, oh, I like it a little brighter. Perfect. You now have the tool to do that. That's what I want to give you, okay? Me personally, I want to introduce you to Amanda, but not so much that you're distracted by what she's wearing. Okay. So for that, I don't mind the um the 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 blacks being a little bit on the darker side. All right. I might, you know, uh throw open the shadows just a touch. Okay. Uh um, and that works fine for me. That's that's perfect. Okay, does that answer the question? Okay, all right. Any uh, any other questions about anything we've done? We're good. All right. How about from you from you new people? Balavi, this is all brand new stuff for you, right? All right. Gloria is probably like, oh yeah, I remember this lesson. <laughs> Uh, yeah. yeah yeah okay um so uh you know so hopefully now you have a little bit of understanding of of the different zones and how you can kind of push and pull uh uh pixels into the into the different zones depending on what your needs are okay all right uh, that's pretty much the lesson for today. So, uh, you know, we're going to open up the rest of the session to Q and a, uh, it could be about this or it could be, you know, anything else that's hanging you up, uh, uh, on Lightroom. Okay. Anybody? Uh, question. Um, I noticed you're using Lightroom, but you usually use Lightroom Classic. This is Lightroom Classic. Oh, this is yeah, button. yeah. Where do you find the Instagram to add it to the screen? I'm oh, right, right now. Okay, all right. That is a great question. It then occurred to me that yes, uh, Lightroom is quite customizable. Okay, uh, if you are in the grid mode, you're gonna find it uh, on the top of the right hand side. Okay. If you are in the develop mode, you're gonna find it in the same place. If you don't see it, all right, right click on any of the blank areas of these bars, okay, and customize develop panel, all right? And this allows you to turn on and turn off. Oh, well, no, the histogram should be should be there okay all right if you don't see it 
All right. Uh, the other thing is check uh, where it says histogram. If you see the word histogram, there's there's a little arrow. All right. That arrow needs to point down. Okay. And then you'll see it. Yes. Yes. Okay. Awesome. All right. Yeah. I uh I I kind of knew that you couldn't hide it. I just couldn't remember it. All right. But yeah, if you want to uh hide permanently hide any of those, you could come in here and uncheck them. Uh I don't know why you would hide any of these cuz they all do have their purpose. Okay? But anyway. All right. Other questions? Comments, concerns. Uh, I have, I oh. have a, an observation. Let me get set up here. So I, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we were, I was, uh, we were talking about phones and Lightroom. And in the past, I've asked about getting between a phone and a computer. And, and quite by accident, I found out that it's been time if I have Lightroom, my computer that if I've done something on my phone, the way the libraries work, they sync up together. Yes. So that's been kind of handy for things. If I I had something last week I had on my phone, I wanted to get it down onto my computer to work on a little better and it just kind of worked out good. So. Right, right. Pass that along. So now I, I'm using that and then I'm still using Smug Mug to bounce things around back and forth uh, between phones and <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah 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 okay cool all right uh Pallavi put it into the all right uh Pallavi, uh i take it you don't have a microphone hooked up probably not um i know you have your cameras hooked up so uh but anyway um i just a heads up I am terrible at glancing over my other screen and checking the chat. <laughs> it just so happens that it caught my attention this time, but Pallavi put in a question uh, into uh, the chat. Should we be using the skin tone to make the judgment on exposure or other elements such as clothing, etc., too? Um, good question. I'm assuming you're talking about uh, uh, exposure during the photo pro uh, photo taking process. Uh, and if that's the case, then the answer is yes. But, all right, photography, uh, you know, there are a lot of wild card variables in photography and, and people are, you know, who've been doing it long enough know this, okay? Um, getting a proper exposure is a juggling act and every situation you're in is going to present you with different things to juggle. Okay. Sometimes you're juggling silk scarves that float nicely down and you're able to manipulate them very easily. Other times you're juggling, uh, chainsaws. All right, and a one wrong step and you're cutting something off and you're not going to be able to retrieve it. Okay. But typically, typically, what you want to do is you want to get a proper exposure to whatever your subject is. So if you're doing portraits, obviously skin tone is important. Okay. So the true tone color of a person's skin, you want that properly exposed, all right? <clears throat> if you're doing product photography, the true tone color of whatever it is that you're photographing is important, all right? If you're a fashion, design, a fashion photographer, the clothing is the important part, okay? Everything else to that is secondary and subservient to it, and you can manipulate it along the way. 
that being said, there's also artistic interpretation. All right. I've seen uh, images where the exposure is manipulated outside of its normal range for artistic reasons. All right. I've seen portraits where, you know, they've they tend to under uh, expose the skin just a touch. OK, uh, or overexpose it a little bit just to make it pop forward a little bit more. OK, it's all salt and pepper to shake, you know, to uh, to um, taste. Um, but typically you want to expose for whatever it is. All right. Where it gets tricky is if you are in a situation where you really cannot control your exposure and you need to worry about the darks as well as the highlights, all right? And this tends to be high contrast lighting situations. In that case, what you wanna do is typically split the difference, okay? So what you're doing is you're purposely either underexposing or overexposing, all right, this, these are terms that are usually referred to as exposing to the left or exposing to the right in order to preserve the detail in those specific areas, all right? Whatever happens in the middle, happens in the middle. And that's where we need to go in in post-processing and correct what happens there. Because what we're doing is we're favoring one or two one or both ends of our exposure range, right? And letting the center go to whatever it happens to go to, knowing that we can manipulate the center a little bit more than we can the ends, all right? So going back to our, oops, wrong one. Oh, hold on, wrong one, there we go. Wait, wait. Here we go. That's one. Going back to, <laughs> going to find the button. Going back to our spring analogy, okay? Our white point and our black point, all right, are locked. You cannot go blacker than black, and you cannot go whiter than pure white, all right? So those two ends... All right, there's no manipulation there, okay, uh, past those points, okay? We can take that black and bring it into the shadows, all right, which is called exposing to the left, or we can take our white points and bring it into our highlights, which means exposing to the right, okay? And whatever happens here happens here. All right, hopefully that made a little sense. All right. Oh, awesome. She says, yes, thank you. Okay. All right. <clears throat> that was a great question. Any other questions before? Uh... No? Okay. We're going to be... Uh... Early evening, I guess. Okay. All right. Um, Pallavi does not have a microphone, so I cannot ask her. Well, I can ask her. She could probably type it out, you know, if you want to type it out. Uh, what did you think of this session? But I'll ask the same question to Michelle, since Michelle's also brand spanking new to our session. What what you think of uh, our class? I really enjoyed it. Um, I really like the fact of learning about the center focus, like with the, the bottom part of her blouse, I would not have thought to really change that exposure. And I like the way the end result is as you really focus on Amanda and her face and to her it's kind of like speaking, the photograph speaks for itself. That was really- Absolutely. Fun. And you know, that's the key word. The photo is speaking for itself. All right, which is one of the things that I, I teach is that photography, there is a language to photography. It's a visual language. All right. And yeah, you picked up on that. Perfect. Awesome. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Awesome. 
let your friends know. Are you uh, involved in any camera clubs or camera groups? Uh, not a time. I'm on a, a Facebook, which for, is for Connecticut photography. Mm -hmm. uh, but just a lot of people, um, you know, post what they're taking photos. And lately, it's been a lot of a lot of uh, another hiking site. I do a lot of hiking, so everyone just posts their pictures from using yeah, cameras yeah, yeah. to cell phones and. Uh, but I've just started out, so I'm at the very beginning, learning where to go. No, that's go. that's fine. Yeah. Uh, so I have a lot to learn. Cool. Well, if you if you like the session and you you know people that might benefit from it, invite them sure. along. I will do that. Awesome. Do you normally meet on Mondays or? Yep. The the week? first three Mondays of the month. Uh, okay, yeah. So the first Monday, which is today, uh, is Lightroom. Next week, it's going to be Photoshop. Uh, and then the third week is a general Q&A. And, uh, oh, perfect transition, good segue. Uh, thank you for easing that. Uh, what, what I'm starting to do is invite people into the studio for that third Monday. Um, I open it up to my Patreon members who want to come in and do anything uh, here in the studio with me and it could be anything. All right. So last month Gloria came in and obviously we uh, Photographed a model. It was all about, you know, lighting the person and it was, you know, we did it with a with a, We started off with a single light, you know, and then we went to a two light setup and here it is Okay um, So uh, Can you mention Patreon members. Mm -hmm. How does one become a Patreon member? <laughs> so Patreon, Patreon.com uh, is a website where, you know, it allows people to help support artists like myself uh, mm -hmm. by making a monetary pledge. Um, okay. And I have the, the basis, you know, $5 a month. So if you can spare five bucks a month, I really appreciate mm -hmm. it. It's not, I, I don't, you know, it's not essential. I offer these sessions free, but, you know, for my Patreons, I do, you know, offer uh, additional levels. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, um, I invite my Patreons to come into the studio so they can get a one-on-one -on -one, uh, learning experience. Um, now, do you have um, a course as far as basic operations of a digital camera? I, I don't have Lightroom yet. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just trying to figure out what's the basics. I think that for me, the basics I need to learn is how to use my cam camera. But I really enjoy yeah. this a lot. Um, so that's something to learn. I, yeah, I usually will do um, photo walks uh, okay. and photo workshops during the warmer weather. Uh, obviously with COVID, it kind of put the, you know, put those live workshops, uh, on yeah. hiatus, but, uh, uh, we did a few this year. Uh, and of course, um, the Connecticut PPA is, uh, getting back into doing their monthly events. Um, you know, they, they only do it once a month, but there are other camera clubs that will do, um, um, you know, photo walks, which is a great way of of learning. All right, you learn by doing. That's I can't stress yeah. enough that for you can watch all the videos in the world, you can read all the books. You're not going to learn photography. You have okay. to go out and do it, okay? Yeah. Because it's a combination of just technique memorization, but also muscle memory. You know, the 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 camera is a machine with buttons in very specific places that do very specific things. All right. And you need to build up your your not only the memory of what each button does, but where they're located. So while you have the camera here, you can manipulate those buttons without going right. like, what's this? <laughs> what's this? You know, so if you're paying attention here. All the actions happening over there, guess what? You're not photographing. You're not photographing the action, all right? So if you can get it where you can follow the action and manipulate your camera at the same time, you're golden. 
fantastic. Thank you. All right, but it takes practice. Um, uh, but yeah, I also do one-on-one -on -one private lessons if, you know, if it means a lot and you want to really, you know, ramp it up, uh, I do that as well. Okay. Oh, okay. That's great. Thank you. All right. But, you know, anyway. Um, so. I have a quick question. Yes. About the upcoming Shep Hog Dam Day. So if I were to go out and want to rent a lens for the day and, you know, for take, trying out taking pictures of flying birds, big ones like the eagles, what would you suggest? Ah, okay. <laughs> um, by the way, you will, I've been there a few times um, mm -hmm. and they do, it's through December through March. And yeah. when they have the time frames that you can book and anyone can go, there's no cost for it. But it's an amazing experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how was what? Um, talk a little bit about your experience of actually seeing the birds. Well, so the only drawback I find is there's the wires that are sometimes in the in the way of your shot, mm -hmm. right? So you're up here. There's a kind of like a little house for lack of better words. So a little cabin that they build keeps you warm and you can shoot from inside. Or you can go outside and you're on a hill looking down. Mm -hmm. um, but the great thing is, is each time that I've gone, I mean, they've literally flown overhead and they've taken their time, whether that was, you know, they're wild animals, obviously. Yeah. And you really get a lot of opportunity so if you go, I say, don't stay inside the whole time. Really get outside. And awesome. the multiples. The last time I went, there was 21 eagles there. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you, don't, you know, like towards the end of the season, because they're coming down through Canada. They're coming up from south, north. So they're all different directions. So they migrate. And they're, oh, there's multiple at certain times of the year. So you can't, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say exactly when but yeah the colder yeah. it is the better it is for lack of better words okay but cool. get outside just as well dress for it but get outside too because to watch them soar over your head and just to get that shot yeah it's just an amazing experience yeah. in itself awesome thank you thank you and that's all, all right I'll say and i'll leave it up to you guys and just i say go if you get an opportunity yeah I no i i've been wanting to go i every time i see images from that place i'm always amazed all right yeah so before i answer your your question brian i'm going to tell you a story of my own all right way back in the day way back in the day uh <laughs> uh um in the early days of meetup.com, uh, I decided I was going to set up my own meetup.com group. <laughs> and I like, what should my first meetup be? Well, so, you know what? I've always wanted to uh, photograph eagles. And so I went online looked up uh, Eagle Watch, Eagle Observations, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and I came across a guided tour by a guy out in like Clinton, Madison area. Uh, and, I, and I go, oh, this is awesome. He knows where all the sites are. And he, he can point out you know, all the eagles and stuff. And it's along the Connecticut River. The Connecticut River is known for its eagles. Okay. So I said, so that'll be our first meetup. And uh, we're just going to pretty much piggyback onto his observation group. And they were meeting at the ferry that goes across, uh, you know, to where... Um, um, Oh, the castle, the Haddam, uh, Gillette Castle is, okay? You know that ferry? I don't know if it's still in operation, uh, but there was a ferry there. And that was our meeting point. Okay. I had my first DSLR camera, the uh, Canon 40D, 
with a 7300 lens. All right. And I show up and I'm looking at all these eagle watchers and they have these these uh, uh, binoculars that are like half half the length of their torsos. OK, and uh, uh, introduce myself to the uh, group leader. And I go, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to this, you know, of you pointing out all the eagles. And he goes, oh, oh, you want to photograph the eagles? And he looks at my camera and he, with that. And he kind of chuckled and says, good luck. <laughs> oh, my God. And he was right. I was so unprepared. I was such a noob. We're on one side of the river. And he's go, oh, there's a, you know, a, a young male. You can tell because of the this and that and the other. And everybody's bringing up these huge binoculars to their eyes. And he's pointing to a tiny little speck about four miles over on the other side of the river. And I'm like, yeah, I'm very unprepared. <laughs> I totally underestimated that that event, and we ended up, uh, you know, we ended up taking pictures of other stuff. We we did what we could, but we did not photograph eagles. All right, but to answer your question, because the eagles are fairly close, but like Michelle said, they, you know, it's a it's a controlled environment, but they are wild animals, and and there is a certain amount of distance. Uh, if you want to close that distance, you want four, five, or six hundred millimeter lens. Okay, really, if you want to, you know, bring them in close and tight, you want a very powerful zoom lens. All right. Um, I have my one fifty to four hundred, and I'm hoping that's going to be enough. Okay. Thank you. So I don't have a chance. Uh, with your lens, no. Oh, so oh, <laughs> my two hundred seven to two hundred. Yeah, <laughs> that that yeah. Um, no. I say go and experience. You might get lucky, even though it's a two hundred, mm -hmm. and that might fly overhead. So. Just go and experience it and you'll figure it out from there. Yeah, that's right. yeah. yeah. Yeah, but but don't go with high hopes, not with a two hundred millimeter. All right. You like she said, you might get lucky. You might get lucky, mm -hmm. you know, but um mm -hmm. yeah. But there's there's a whole, you know, uh um I wish uh the other Alan was here because he's definitely a, a bird person and he can give a lot of uh, insight into this. Um, not only do you need a long focal length, you also need a very high shutter speed. So you're going to be shooting at five, uh, you know, um, 500 to 1000 uh, shutter speed. So, oh. so you need to, to uh, really, really understand your camera. Uh, mm -hmm. focusing is also a pain in the ass if, if, you know, mm -hmm. you're trying to get birds in flight. Yeah. So, but that vantage point looks down in, onto uh, a, a river. So, you know, but, you know, like Michelle said, you know, if, if come along mm -hmm. for the experience, if nothing else, you know, mm -hmm. so, okay. okay. All right. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Pallavi just posted, I truly enjoyed and learned from the class. Loved how you utilize the spring analogy. Awesome. Uh, you definitely make the class engaging and fun. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay. All right. So, uh, if there are no other questions, okay, uh, next week, we are going to be delving into Photoshop 
I don't have anything set up for that class. So if anybody has a suggestion of something that they want covered, uh, please feel free to to uh, message me and, you know, uh, I'll put it in. Uh, and then for our third class, if anybody wants to come into the studio, uh, just, you know, drop me a line and say, hey, I'm interested in photographing such and such, you know. Uh, we did portrait last time. Maybe we can do something tabletop this time. You know, so think about it. Okay. Especially for those of you who live close by. Okay. All right. Uh, as always, I really, really appreciate you guys. Uh, I hope I put another tool into your toolbox. Uh, and uh, spread the word. You know, let your friends know that, you know, we're here. It's free. We're having a good time. Okay. Thank you, Doc. All righty, dear. Stay safe. Um, again, remember Wednesday, if you're not doing anything around one o'clock, uh, join us in North Haven. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, guys, as always, be safe. Thank you for watching Learning Photography with Duck. Brought to you in association with Milford Photo, your local full-service camera store. Located in downtown Milford, Connecticut, Milford Photo offers you a personalized shopping experience. From the latest camera gear to printing and framing services. And, of course, educational workshops to teach you the finer aspects of photography. Don't forget to tell them Duck sent you.